Audra Stewart, a pediatrician who specializes in neonatology as well as a mother to a child who is hard of hearing. Hi, and I'm Rachel St. John. I am the director of the Family Focused Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Children in the Ear, Nose, and Throat Department at Dallas Children's Medical Center. Dr. Stewart and I are both the Texas State Representatives for the American Academy of Pediatrics Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program, which focuses on best practices for screening, identifying, and providing services for deaf and hard of hearing infants and toddlers birth to three. We're pleased to be able to share important information with you as pediatric medical providers. Our goal is to support your provision of comprehensive medical care for infants and toddlers who are suspected to have or have already been identified as deaf or hard of hearing. As you know, the 1994 Joint Committee on Infant Hearing Position Statement recommended newborn hearing screening for all infants in an effort to identify newborn hearing loss at an early age so as to allow families to access early intervention services to maximize their child's speech and language acquisition. The American Academy of Pediatrics 136 month EDI algorithm was developed as a guideline for pediatric medical providers to support timely screening and follow-up. It is an effective model only when the protocols are followed to support timely attainment of the 136 month goals. Landmark research by Yoshinaga Itano supports this statement. I can attest to this personally as my daughter met the 136 month goals. She's seven years old now and is doing very well in academics and a mainstream classroom educated alongside her hearing peers. Newborn hearing screening is a broad topic with many facets. Physician perspectives and practices have a direct influence on the outcomes of children and families navigating the EDI 136 process. One study of physician perspectives and practices, in particular by Moeller, White, and Schisler, published in Pediatrics in 2006, distributed a newborn hearing screening and follow-up knowledge survey to physicians in 21 states and Puerto Rico. They received 1,968 surveys from physicians and published the results. The respondents were predominantly pediatricians and family practice physicians. As you would imagine, knowledge gaps were identified as a result of this study, but the three we would like to focus on are 1. Earliest age to fit hearing aids, 2. Specialist referrals, and 3. Rescreening in the provider office. Providers in the survey were asked what they believed to be the youngest age that a child could be fitted with hearing aids. In actuality, there is no minimum age for fitting an infant with hearing aids. We as providers are the rate limiting step, so to speak. As soon as an infant is identified as deaf or hard of hearing and can be seen to make ear mold impressions and order hearing aids, they can start wearing them as soon as they're available. This, unfortunately, is an area of misinformation for providers, as only 38% of the respondents in the study felt that a child one month of age or younger could be fitted for hearing aids. Additionally, almost 20% thought a child needed to be at least one year old to receive hearing aids. We know from peer-reviewed research that the earlier we provide intervention opportunities to these children and their families, the better their child's overall developmental outcomes will likely be. Delaying language access opportunities, including both spoken and sign language, means that children will lose critical developmental time in early childhood. Children who are deaf or hard of hearing may have a minimal number of medical needs, or may require complex coordination of care. At minimum, any child who has been identified as deaf or hard of hearing should be offered referrals to three subspecialty providers, along with any others that are deemed necessary by the primary care provider. These three specialists are ENT, 
ophthalmology, and genetics. According to the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing 2007 Position Statement, otolaryngology, or ear, nose, and throat physicians, help determine whether medical and or surgical intervention may be appropriate. When intervention is provided, the otolaryngologist is involved in the long-term monitoring and follow-up with the infant's medical home. The otolaryngologist provides information and participates in the assessment of candidacy for amplification, assistive devices, and surgical intervention, including reconstruction, bone-anchored hearing aids, and cochlear implantation. While the majority of providers in the study, 76%, were aware that the ENT referral should be made, this means that almost a quarter were not. Very few providers who responded to the survey, 8.9%, were aware that a referral to genetics should be offered. Per the JCIH, the medical geneticist is responsible for the interpretation of family history data, the clinical evaluation and diagnosis of inherited disorders, the performance and assessment of genetic tests, and the provision of genetic counseling. Geneticists or genetic counselors are qualified to interpret the significance and limitations of new tests and to convey the current status of knowledge during genetic counseling. All families of children who have been identified as deaf or hard of hearing should be offered and may benefit from a genetics evaluation and counseling. This evaluation can provide families with information on etiology for hearing loss, prognosis for progression, associated disorders such as renal, vision, or cardiac, and information for future family planning. This information may aid parents in their decision making regarding intervention opportunities for their child. Even fewer of the survey responses, only 1%, were aware that referral to a pediatric ophthalmologist should be offered. The JCIH recommends that every child identified as deaf or hard of hearing be evaluated by an ophthalmologist to document visual acuity and rule out concomitant or late onset vision disorders such as Usher syndrome. Additionally, an evidence-based review by Nikolopoulos in 2006 demonstrated that deaf and hard of hearing children are 40 to 60 percent more likely to have some form of a visual problem than the general population, and regular evaluations for vision changes may be warranted. While this is not part of the molar white schistler study, it is important for medical practitioners to understand the duty to report the hearing screening results to the state. Some practitioners have invested in hearing screening equipment to perform newborn hearing screening or outpatient rescreens in the office. If you are one of those practitioners, it is important for you to understand the duty to report child-specific hearing screening results to the state of Texas. House Bill 411, Section 10, Subsection E states, a qualified hearing screening provider, audiologist, intervention specialist, educator, or other person who receives a referral from a program under this chapter shall, one, Provide the services needed by the newborn or infant or refer the newborn or infant to a person who provides the services needed by the newborn or infant. And, two, provide, with the consent of the newborn's or infant's parent, the following information to the department or the department's designee. A, results of follow-up care. B, results of audiologic testing of an infant identified with hearing loss, and C, reports on the initiation of intervention services. Loss to documentation or loss to follow-up is quite a problem in Texas with our rate averaging around 75% in 2011. This means that three quarters of the children who do not pass their initial newborn hearing screening are either not rescreened or their hearing screening results are not reported to the state. Each of us has a professional responsibility to ensure the children of Texas with suspected or diagnosed hearing loss receive timely hearing screening, diagnostic, and early intervention services. 
As part of our responsibility, we must regularly inform the state about the hearing and service point status of each infant or toddler in our care. We hope that you found this information helpful. For more information, please view the additional links for this module posted on the Texas EDI statewide campaign website. Thank you for joining us.